Dear EAA members, dear virtual annual meeting participants, I would like to welcome you to the last keynote in this conference, which at the same time will conclude this meeting. I'm very happy to introduce to you Maria Wunderlich, a very promising young scholar that ha who has agreed to share her thoughts and research with us. I would like to give you a few words on her biography. Currently, Maria is a lecturer and research fellow at the Institute of Pre- and Protohistoric Archaeology at Kiel University. Since 2020, she has been involved in the research of the CRC 1266, Scales of Transformation, Human Environmental Interaction in Prehistoric and Archaic Societies. In her MA thesis, she focused on the inventory, the multifaceted use of a passage grave in northern Germany during the phases of the Middle Neolithic. During her PhD, between 2014 and 2018, she was a research assistant in the DFG project Equality and Inequality, Social Differentiation in Northern Central Europe, 4300 to 2400 BC, also at Kiel University. In her PhD, she focused on the relation between monumental architecture and development of social systems. She has conducted ethno-archaeological research in, on Sumba, Indonesia, and in Nagaland, in Northeast India. Her thesis, which she concluded only in 2018, she was awarded the travel grant of the German Archaeological Institute in 2020. Being interested in social archaeology and comparative analysis, she combines different theoretical approaches with material data derived both from recent and prehistoric contexts. She is author of the book Megalithic Monuments and Social Structures, Comparative Studies on Recent and Funnel Beaker Societies. And she has co-edited volumes on megaliths, societies, landscapes, early monu monumental monumentality and social differentiation in Neolithic Europe, and also archaeology in the Sitava Valley, the LBK and Zielover watch a settlement site of rubble. Her research is focused on the intersection of archaeological and cultural anthropological questions with an emphasis on the Neolithic of Central and Northern Europe. Please, Maria, speak to us. Thank you much. Uh, thank you so much, Sophie, for this kind introduction. So I would like to start uh, with expressing my gratitude for this opportunity to speak here today. I would also like to thank the whole organization team for their efforts in making this organization possible despite the circumstances. Now in the following talk, I will focus on the question you can see here on the title of the first slide. And I would do so from a kind of specific perspective, namely perspective of an anthropologically informed archaeology. And in order to somehow approach this kind of question, I would like to start with two statements. The first of the statements is uh, that archaeology, in my opinion, requires the willingness to include differing worldviews and also possibly altering translations of overarching ideas. Secondly, especially features we might conceive as profane and utility oriented might in fact be often of multi-layered meaning. Now from these two statements, I think we can conclude that we are indeed in need of diverse and variable ways of understanding and also of different angles of interpretation. And I would like to further approach this question on a quite of yeah, quite specific example. And this example is concerned with the broader topic of water and waterscapes, and more specifically with the implications of artificial water sources. 
And the reason why I choose this example, you can see here a statement by two cultural anthropologists from 2010 who called water a total social fact. And this kind of statement, uh, or the statement, sorry, is actually derived from um, Marcel Moos, who in his yeah, famous work on the gift called exchange a total social phenomenon. And what he's meaning with this is that a phenomenon, also archaeological phenomena, in my opinion, might be, uh, might be including multiple meanings and mechanisms which are somehow pooling together in them. So they might be uh, giving expression to, for example, religious, moral, economic, um, also political aspects of the societies we are talking about. And I will talk about this kind of example on the basis of my own ethnoarchaeological research. So this will be the first case study I will present to you. And I will also offer a glimpse into the archaeological record. But I would like to start very briefly with a um, yeah, kind of um, notion on the theoretical frameworks of archaeological interpretation, which I see as a subject to intermingling meanings. And I would like to just briefly point to what three different aspects, which are in my own research very important and which also are, in my opinion, gaining more increasing momentum in at least the last 10 years. First of all, these are bottom up perspectives. And with bottom up perspectives, I also mean an increasing focus on non elites and also the application of diverse theoretical frameworks, such as, for example, anarchist theory. And the very good thing, at least in my opinion, about this kind of frameworks and theoretical approaches, is they are indeed trying to give them um, or talk about the choices people do and the very grounding mechanism of the societies involved. Now, the second aspect, which is very much in the heart of any kind of archaeological interpretation, is the aspect of analogical reasoning. And uh, the notion of archaeology as anthropology is, of course, rather old. But uh, it's still a topic of major importance, not only in ethnoarchaeological approaches. We can, for example, also see in more current approaches like agent-based modeling that also these kind of methods are very much relying on analogical inferences. And lastly, I would like to point to what's the uh, uh, massive importance of reflective um, approaches or um, perspectives. So we saw lively debates on the question of determinism within the archaeological frameworks. And we can also see how important the reflection of our epistemological basis is. And lastly, we also can see how the urges to establish post and colonial, uh, post and anti-colonial, sorry, archaeologies are also gaining more prominence. And since I myself, uh, from the context of ethnoarchaeological research, I would like to go a bit more into detail of this subject. And I would like to start this uh, by, yeah, first of all, saying that, in my opinion, one of the major um, advantages of ethnoarchaeological research is that they are indeed offering global perspectives. So although ethnoarchaeology is derived from this new archaeology context and also from a, yeah American point of view, so to say, uh, of research, we can see various independent schools of research which developed and in the last years different approaches to ethnoarchaeology, for example, in Asia, in the Americas, in Russia, and so on. So ethnoarchaeological research is indeed offering many false perspectives. But of course, regardless of the context uh, we are talking about here, one of the major problems lies in the issue of direct analogies. And what I mean here is that there's an extensive critique, also still lasting critique, on the direct transfer of anthropological models onto archaeological case studies. And this is very much concerned, especially with this very complex and very concrete, but also very specific models or uh, examples of human social organization. For example, typologies of societies, you probably only all know these examples, for example, big man societies or chiefdoms. And uh, I think when we are simply using this kind of models to explain the archaeological record, we are in danger of actually losing variability. So I do agree with a lot of the critique which was concerned um, at the direct 
use of analogies. And what's the dangers? I'm showing here, I mean, for example, the loss of variability, because in my opinion, we have to assume that in the past there's a sheer endless possibility of different forms of social organization. So if we now focus too much on this very big and broad and yeah, ever or all explaining models, we are in danger of losing this kind of variability and we also might search for the present in the past. But of course, there are alternatives to this kind of direct analogies. And uh, I would like to point here towards an approach which is focusing more on particular traits or particular phenomena. So we are, of course, able to compare a specific phenomena in the in recent examples. And of course, it's also necessary to contextualize these kind of examples. But they might be used to construct frames of reference. And these frames of reference might in turn be used to be tested for their validity in the archaeological record. But most of all, they can be used to broaden our understanding of possibilities in the past. So this is very much, very much not about the search for similar causal mechanism, but uh, this is how analogical reasoning might be used in its explanatory potential of archaeological, archaeologically invisible aspects. And from this kind of notion, I think a lot of potentials are deriving. For example, I think we should always ask ourselves which presumptions are still influential without, within our frames of interpretation. For me, an example might be, how do we actually perceive complexity? So do we see complexity as being concerned with, for example, social hierarchization and social inequality and also economic factors? Or do we have a much broader picture of what complexity might mean? So this is very much concerned with the variability of human materi material interrelationships. And it's also concerned with uh, the try to go beyond ethnocentric and Eurocentric views. And also due to the lasting critique and also massive critique, I think that many ethnoarchological approaches nowadays are very much concerned with integrating reflective approaches. But of course, I'm not saying here that ethnoarchology or a notion of archaeology as anthropology is somehow the solution to all our problems. This is indeed not the case. And this can only be one note within this kind of networks of reasoning and interpretation. And because of this very fragmented state of the archaeological remains, we have to use all these different methods, all these different approaches or effective approaches, diverse theoretical frameworks, but also, of course, archaeological science and so on, in order to construct holistic understandings of the past. And now, with giving this kind of broader framework of my theoretical framework, I would like to start and present you the ethno-archaeological case study, which is situated in Nagaland in India. And uh, what I'd like to show you somehow, or what I will come up with at the end of this case study, is this kind of scheme. And in the following, I will try to explain you how I came up with this kind of concept, how artificial water sources are embedded in a specific network of meaning in the case of Nagaland. But maybe first, a very short introduction. So Nagaland is located in the northeastern part of India. You can see here on the left, the different ethnic groups being presented, not only in Nagaland, but also the neighboring states. So maybe you have seen it already on the photo I showed you. It's a mountainous and hilly landscape. And uh, the diversity of ethnic groups is quite high in this region. On the right side, you can see a second map. And here you can see the study area where I'm working in uh, within the cooperation of the University of Nagaland and Kiel University. So this area is the southern part of Nagaland. And the communities which are living there are communities of Angami and Chakasang Naga. So this is the case study or the context I will be talking about. But before I start with the data itself, so to say, I would like to very briefly point to what's the fact that indeed in this kind of um, scientific um, background of Nagaland, archaeology and anthropology are indeed seen as part of one overall perspective. So 
So what we can see here in this scientific tradition is very much uh, the urge to decolonize archaeological practice, to develop community-based approaches within archaeology, and also to connect, for example, folklore with archaeology. So this is very much uh, this interming intermingling perspectives of archaeology and anthropology. But going back to the communities themselves, uh, both Angami and Chakasang communities are actually known to be, or are quite well known for being very egalitarian societies, which of course are characterized by complexity, but also very permeable hierarchies. And the most important social institutions in this kind of context um, are the clans. So clans are social groups, and they are very important for diverse forms of cooperation, but they are also very important uh, for the political structure of the communities. And kids are not an important social group anymore, so this changed a lot, but they are still an important spatial unit, and they can be roughly translated as neighborhoods, so to say. But the importance of clans is in many regards still meaningful. So here some things changed, uh, some other things did not change. And um, with regard to this kind of complexity and permeable hierarchies, it's important to say that some time ago, so nowadays the situation is also changing a lot, but the most important political unit used to be the village council. And the membership within these village councils was based on achievement and age-based authorities. Um, but only men, so no women, were allowed in this kind of village council. Despite of this, you can see here the different persons who had access to this kind of um, council system, or also who had political influence. And you can see many of the positions are actually concerned with people who are known for having some achievements and who are known for their skills or other characteristics. And with that, I would like to come to the case study of water. And uh, to give a very short um, side note, so to say, on the rel relevance of freshwater in Nagaland, it must be said that in many areas of Nagaland, water and freshwater is actually a resource of scarcity. So rivers, streams, and also springs might be located in quite a distance to the different villages. Wells are always located outside of the village, and they are partly exhibited in quite elaborate stone platforms. But in the following, I will not talk further about wells or river streams, but I will instead focus on two examples of uh, purely artificial freshwater sources and how they're embedded within the social structure. And the first of these examples is actually concerned with the most important and very basic um, practice of these mountain economies we can find in this area. So the most important form of economic practice is wet rice terrace cultivation. And what you can see here uh, is an impression uh, of different terrace fields within this context of Angami communities. And it's very important to note that within these contexts, all the different fields, without exception, are always owned by individual persons. So they're owned by either one individual or by an individual household, but they're not a subject to collective land ownership. Those are just other areas, but never these fields. And the example I would like to show you, or the reason why I'm showing you this kind of terrace fields, is that the terrace fields are uh, subject to quite an interesting secondary way of use. So the first or the primary economic context here is, of course, wet rice cultivation. So the fields are flooded for um, in order to harvest the rice. And after the harvest is done, the water is usually put out of the fields. But as you can see here in the, in the photos, those are taken due, during the dry season. So what you can see here is that some of the, of the terrace fields are remained in a flooded status or they are flooded again. And this is concerned with this kind of secondary use. So we have after the rice harvest, uh, the breeding of fishes and sweetwater snails within these terrace fields. And the very interesting part of the whole story is actually that I told you that all these fields without exception are individually owned. 
But as soon as the secondary context is starting, they are simply shifting to a very different framework. They are used in a common way. They're also seen as collective property or perceived as collective property because the individual landowner actually has no right to deny other persons the access in this framework of fishing activities and so on. Now, the second example I would like to show you is the example of artificial lakes and water ponds. These are occurring only in the southern part of Nagaland among Angami and Mao Naga. And all these artificial ponds you can see here on the photo are actually commemorative monuments. And they are actually connected to a social institution, which is nowadays not done anymore, so it lost its importance completely. But uh, for the social structures, it used to be the most important institution in the villages, the so-called Feasts of Merit. The Feasts of Merit constitute feasting activities, so a stage system of a minimum of five different feasts, which was organized by an individual feast giver. And the whole goal or the aim of this kind of activity was to achieve social renown and status and also political influence by being a member of the village council. Now, the different stages of the fields were actually materialized by different means. You can see it here on the photos. On the top, you can see this kind of house horns made from wood, symbolizing the lower stages. And then you can see the stones, which are usually signifying the highest stages. And then there's this very interesting exception, so to say, the ponds, which are a symbol for the highest stage of the feast. So they are materialization of this last stage of feasting activities. And this also explains that there's a differing number of monoliths and ponds, because actually only very few people were able to achieve this kind of life task and uh, also begin a new life, by, which is symbolized by water. And in general, this kind of activity was very much influenced. So the feasting activity in general was influenced by economic inequality, competition, and these factors. And again, we have a very interesting circumstance here. So as soon as the ponds were erected and finished, they again shifted into the common framework of the village. They were open to any kind of use by the village community and were seen as collective property, but just when they were finished. So and you, that you just have kind of an yeah, imagination about this kind of feasting system. Here you can see a seventh stage feasting example of Angami Naga communities. And you can see here the different stages. On the right side, you can see the materialization with the artificial ponds at the very end of this whole system. And I already said it was very hard to achieve this highest stage of the feast. And this can be explained by the amount of resources needed. So here you can see um, how many animals had to be slaughtered, how many cattle and pigs had to be slaughtered for each and every feast. And this amount of resources was almost never possibly uh, given by only one household. So what happens here is that actually all the time, different clan members were somehow cooperating. So it was more of a collective enterprise, so to say, to enable at least some of the clan members to achieve this kind of high status and also the influence which was going hand in hand with that. But both the stones and also the ponds are not only a materialization of competition for status and influence, they are also a very important part of constructing a social landscape. So here you can see a very typical outline of an Angami and Chakasang village in which the village is in the center and surrounding the village, we have a space of social reproduction in which monumentality is signified by stones, so stone and water. And you can see that this kind of social reproduction area is actually an arena of uh, social reproduction, I'm sorry, but also of uh, competition and cooperation. And it's actually somehow connecting the village and the economic areas themselves. And I think what is quite clearly visible with regard to these artificial water sources is that they are characterized by dialectic aspects. So they are both a means of, or, yeah, a means of social signaling, but they are also symbolizing reciprocity. They are both a materialization of economic inequality and in common frameworks, both, comp comp both competition and cooperation. And in order to put this kind of artificial freshwater sources 
within a network of meanings, three aspects are of major importance. First of all, there's the aspect of temporality. And this means that a given feature, for example, a field or a pond, is possibly a subject to temporal contextualization. It might be embedded in different networks of meaning and action due to a perceived and or optional role, which is in turn depending on the temporal context. So with regard to the terrorist fields, this means that we have two temporal contextualizations, primary and secondary economic contexts. First of all, the primary context is related to rice cultivation. The second one is related to breeding of fish and snakes. But most importantly, we can see here a very clear change from strictly individual property towards the perception and also used as communal land. Secondly, there's the aspect of connectivity. So a given feature might be possibly a bridge between different social arenas and the respective connection towards one or the other arena may experience stronger or weaker emphasis due to the situational context. So it's actually an expression of different aspects of the social organization. With regard to the artificial ponds, this means that we can see they are clearly and first and foremost the maturization of feasting activities. So they're influenced by this, by a collective action cooperation, but also by competition and economic inequality. And therefore, they are bridging these very different, but also very influential aspects of the social organization. And deriving from these two different, uh, the first two aspects is the aspect of plurality. So a given feature might be a representation of different meanings, which is context dependent and also might be a specific translation of overarching ideas. And with reference to the artificial water sources in Nagaland, this means that we can see the clear temporal contextualization of different sources. We can see how the emphasis on levels of meaning and action is shifting, and we can see how different frameworks are of importance here. And to maybe give you a bit of a better visualization about this, here's the example of the terrace fields. So here you can see, and I'm using my mouse for that, here you can see the primary context, um, which is the individualized framework in which surplus production, feasting, and so on was important, but it's a yeah, strictly individual context. And then after this context is fulfilled, uh, or this purpose is fulfilled, we see a shift, a dramatic shift into a collective framework. The field is flooded and used for fishing. And then afterwards, it's simply changing back. And this goes on and on. So it's actually a never ending story, so to say. And this is also how, uh, how I came up with this kind of visualization. So this is this kind of network of meanings you can see here already on this very, um, uh, two very basic kind of features, so to say. So what we do see is how artificial fresh water is embedded into this two very, very, very important aspects of the social organization, namely competition and economic inequality and commonality and cooperation. And the materializations of freshwater sources, for example, ponds and terrace fields and so on, they are somehow moving within the space. They are connected to specific um, actions such as social signaling and the Feast of Merit. And all these different aspects are moving within this network and are shifting in their importance, so to say. So where to go from here? I hope that I ex established uh, some kind of frame of reference with regard to the artificial freshwater sources in Nagaland. And they are indeed uh, what Marcel Moos called a, so a total social phenomenon because they are bridging different social arenas and they are subject to shifting temporal contextualizations. Now, the next question, of course, is what is the explanatory potential here? And in order to have a look into this further question, I would like to have a look into a very different example. So we are making a very big shift now into the context of artificial water sources in the early Neolithic. So the context is more broadly related to water use uh, or the use of fresh water by prehistoric communities. But more specifically, I would like to refer to a very uh, special kind of feature or category I will refer now to uh, wells in the context 
of the early Neolithic societies of the LBK. And of course, now we might ask ourselves why to take this example. Of course, we might say, well, simply a well. And uh, of course, we also know that there might be some depositions. Uh, but I think what we still can see is how much certain features might be percepted as rather profane and rather clearly um, contextualized features. So the questions deriving from this perception of a well as a simple well, so a means to fetch fresh water and to support uh, the need of a given community for fresh water uh, leads towards questions which are standing in the foreground, which are mostly concerned or might be concerned with efficiency and utility. And this doesn't mean that there's not a debate also on other aspects. So I have here some examples and there are many more of course of different colleagues who are very much concerned with the question of social and ritual factors which are connected to this kind of feature but still what i would like to try now is to take this kind of frame of reference i tried to establish um, before and see where how it might help us to gain a more holistic understanding of this kind of special feature and for that um, I will come in a second into different examples, just very briefly, maybe the context. So the context uh, are the LBK communities, the linear band keramic in the context of Central Europe. You can see here the distribution area of these very early, the earliest farming communities in what is nowadays Central Europe here on this map marked in dark green. So these communities or this phenomenon better to put it, is dating between 5,500 and 4,900 BC. And it's actually characterized at least partly by quite high degree of uniformity throughout this whole and quite vast distribution area, for example, with reference to house construction and also material culture. So what we can maybe assume is that there are indeed some overarching ideas uh, which are shared concerning the social organization of these communities. Um, and what is very interesting in this kind of context is that, at least for the for an example of uh, early Neolithic communities, there is a comparatively high number of wells known from this context. So this is why it's very suitable for the example of wells. The earliest example of these wells is possibly dating already to the very beginning of the phenomenon of the LBK, uh, but we can see a very clear peak in construction activities around 5,300 and 5,100 BC. And what I will do now is simply going through some examples of these wells, and I would like to check them for this kind of, uh, I will reference back to the three different aspects I was referencing to with regard to the case study of Nagaland. And the first of these aspects is the question of temporality. So this is concerned with the question whether these early Neolithic wells were subject to temporal contextualization and whether or not they were embedded in different networks of action. And I think that we can indeed very clearly see that we have changing patterns of use with regard to the wells. So from all these known examples, there are actually very diverse um, patterns visible. So some wells are constructed, then used, and then we have infillings which contains sediment waste, so quite clearly, shirts and bone material and so on. So it's rather clearly simply sediment waste, which was somehow dumped into this well, with which, which was not used anymore. But then we also have different examples. For example, this exemplar here, this is a well of Alcherbets. And uh, you can see on the left side the construction of this example. And in the middle, you can see one of the probably two deposition layers and this upper of this upper layer of these two layers contained a high amount of pottery, but not this kind of fragmented pottery, but actually complete vessels. So over all in all, over 10 complete vessels in this kind of layer, and you can see also that some of the vessels were already repaired when they were deposited. And this kind of practice was taking place quite at the end of the biography of the well. But uh, since this kind of composition, it's very different and very specific, here we can assume that this is uh, reflecting quite a ritual pattern of use. Sorry. 
Um, but we can also see different temporal contextualization with regard to the question of the position practices. So this is a, a well of Gelich Prodau. You can see here that uh, actually two piglets were found within the context of this well, and they were not found within this wooden box, but they were found within the construction pit of the well. And this is quite interesting because this points towards the fact that the deposition of the piglets was taking place at the very beginning of the lifetime of the well and not at the end. So here we have quite different temporal dynamics being at play, but we still have this changing or shifting pet, uh, use, uh, pattern of use. Sorry. With that, I would like to focus on the second aspect, the aspect of connectivity. So the question whether wells as a specific materialization, specific kind of feature, might be seen as a bridge between social arenas. Um, and uh, in this question, I'm focusing mostly on the question whether or not that might have been a representation of social inequality or commonality. So also two very basic and very important um, mechanisms within a society. And here you can see the site of Niederröbling. So this is a site where several wells were found and some of them uh, are surely dating into LBK context. You can see one of those examples in this uh, the very nice or very interesting thing here is that the well was uh, positioned or located within very close proximity to a contemporaneous house. So you can see the spatial relation between the house and the well is very clear. Why it might be seen as a representation of social inequality is because a number of houses and a number of wells were found. And uh, quite a lot of these wells seem to have been in very close relation to different houses. It also seems, at least with some caution, that it might be the case that the bigger houses were accompanied by, specific, by single wells, while the smaller houses may have been not. And if this is actually the case, then this is, uh, I would say, it's pointing more towards function of materializing and symbolizing inequality. A very different example is the site of ITRA. So here we also have an LBK settlement and here you have two wells from the LBK which were probably dating one after the other. And you can see a very different kind of spatial layout. Both wells are marked in red and they are both positioned in the very center of the village. And more importantly they are located in some distance or very clear distance, in one case 40 meter, in the other case 10 to 6 meter, to the next contemporaneous house. So they are located in a free space in the center of the village and might have been a subject to sharing activities and communal aspects. Again, a different spatial layout, so to say, is uh, to be seen in the site of Drostorf. Here we can see a whole cluster of wells, here at least six LBK wells, maybe due to hydrological reason in proximity to the city, uh, to the settlement, but not directly added. But here is another well, again, in proximity to the houses, but not associated with one single house. So again, we might here have some kind of common framework being at play. And this leads towards the last aspect, the question of plurality. So whether or not we can see context dependence and also altering or different translations of overarching ideas within this kind of feature of wealth. And I would like to point towards, first of all, the temporal um, diversity we can see very clearly being at play here. So you can see how we have shifting patterns of use. We have both ritual and profane activities going on here, but in very different kind of trajectories. So we can see wells which are constructed, immediately used for ritual purposes, and then maybe used. Then we can see wells which are constructed, then used in a profane way, to, so to say. And just at the end, we have depositions. And there might also be examples where the depositions were taking place in between, so to say. So we can see how different this kind of shared overarching idea that this kind of very elaborate well structures might be a good part or necessary part of a village is uh, very, it's translated in a very different way. And maybe more interestingly, even to me at least, is the question of 
symbolizing different social arenas. So we can very clearly see that wealth might be pointing towards commonality. So we can see examples where different houses are sharing a well. And in this context, I mean sharing in a sense that we can see a combination of autonomy and dependence being at play here. But we can also clearly see other examples in which wells are connected to singular houses. These examples, with some caution, might date at the very uh, end or later stages of the LBK. So a uh, period in which we can also see social tension arising in different other contexts. So all in all, I would say it's a very interesting example, which is actually showing a lot of diversity and different layers of meaning being united here. So it's uh, not a simply profane well, which is used as a well, but it's indeed something so much more. And with that, I would like to come to a conclusion. And I would like to start this conclusion with simply rephrasing the question I was asking at the in the title of my talk. So of course, it has to be rephrased in a way that we should ask how it is possible to understand the multi-layered character of past human social organization. And to me, it is time and also necessary to go beyond universal models of social organization and to really talk about what do we actually mean by terms such as complexity, social inequality, or also chiefdom. So this doesn't mean that we can in not, no case use this kind of models, but we really, really need to have a closer look and we, we need to be very specific to talk about which phenomena, which materializations are we looking at and which kind of social implications are we seeing in these? So which kind of things are expressed within this kind of features? And to my understanding, um, an anthropological, anthropological, I'm sorry, <laughs> anthropologically informed archaeology is indeed of great help in this rather big task. And I would also like to refer to the importance of overcoming dichotomous perception. So for example, the example of LBK Wells, in my opinion, showed that this kind of this differentiation between profane and rituals actually may be um, not really important and also not really relevant in this kind of example. So it might be actually part of one and the same thing at the end. And what my own research in this kind of recent context in Nagaland, for example, showed me is how even the most profane and most um, simple features such as a terrace field might actually be filled with a multitude of meanings which are at interplay here and uh, they are expressed by different means by temporality and contextuality and this is all for me it's, a, it's about the choices of course also the agency of the communities which are subject to our own research and with that I hope that I might have raised some questions for you and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Maria, for this fascinating talk. Yeah, to putting together so things so far away, but obviously water is the is the bracket in this, and uh, the way how communities interact and uh, comp have a competition, are still working together at the same time. There, there's still applause uh, and. Um, for your lecture and while we while we wait from for the first question from the floor um, maybe for a question from me uh, regarding uh, Nagaland you, you describe this um, uh, multi-stage uh, of, of feasting of, of the feast of merit and when they slaughter the pigs and the cattle and mm -hmm. I thought Immediately, this can't be Hindu, this can't be Muslim, you know, connected. And then I know of the Nagaland, of course, that they have headhunting. So this is also, mm -hmm. so there are the savages, uh, the literal savages in, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the mind of the other religions. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of, you, you never mentioned religion, but what kind of religion would they themselves say they have? Just there? I mean, when uh, it's a bit of a... It's not the easiest topic to be totally honest. So they themselves call it uh, an amiss religion, um, but it's very much um, also influenced uh, by the whole process of Christianization. So they are themselves referring towards uh, this kind of 
passed within with this different form of religion as a dark period rather, and then the advent of Christianity as being the light bringing into the societies. But there are still also some animist communities. And uh, what I can say about this religious context is that it's actually also very diverse. So actually in each and every village, it's a bit different, um, but it's, um, it's of course not savage. So it is of course connected to this kind of social institutions of um, headhunting as well. So that was of course uh, done in the past, uh, but also the feasting activities, but it's of course not a yeah, savage religion, but it's a very diverse form of animist views on religion. Yeah. Yeah, still, it's still applause, <laughs> but no question, really. Let, let's see that whether that's coming soon. Yeah. yeah. Maybe just uh, thank you all for this very nice feedback. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. So for the LBK Wells, mm -hmm. You, you demonstrate a kind of the three phases, the, the building phase, which could be somebody uh, looking for more merit <laughs> by this or getting people to build it. And then it could be the use, which might be part communal. And, the, um, and then you saw uh, showed the, the deposition phase in the end when you have the whole vessels go in and actually it's, the bell is not used anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's... Um, from that. Mm. Ah, right. There is a question. There is a question. Maria, how do you suggest to understand LBK wells as total social fact, perhaps in relation to other, uh, for example, natural water sources? And it's, uh, of course, very interesting. So, I mean, I would understand them as total, total social um, facts because uh, I think that we can see how this very different kind of dynamics of society, these different um, institutions maybe or implications are coming together. That's why I would understand them as a total social fact. And in relation to other sources, I would do so because it's quite clearly that um, I think at least so in some examples that uh, it's a question whether they were even necessary. So this is how we can see that here quite clearly some kind of um, yeah of um, maybe belief that this is for something you should also have was also coming into play. So it was not only necessary or something. So we can see how they were kind of some supplementing the natural water sources which were also there. So the rivers and streams and the springs and so on. And uh, the example of Iska, for example, also shows that uh, there was simply not enough for the whole village. I mean, two wells for, or even one contemporaneous well for the whole village is um, not really sufficient. So this is how I would see it. It's was it somehow used in addition, but uh, I think that it was also used because it was a means to, which was close to the village, close to the people, and which could indeed be used by in this very different ways. So that's that's how I would see it in this kind of example. I hope that this answers the question. <laughs> yeah, I, it, was, it was Alexander Gramsch that answer, mm. asked that. We have from uh, Katharina Botic. Are there more examples of ritual deposits around wells after they were abandoned? Um, yeah, so we have. Um, I mean, I don't know the exact number now out of my head, uh, but there are a number of wells. Um, so it's not only the examples I showed, both in LBK context, we have different wells in which we have this kind of deposition layers. Um, but um, then we also have different other uh, examples of Neolithic wells where quite clearly some deposition practices are also happening. But the problem here very much is, of course, to differentiate this kind of ritual deposition from simply dumping your sediment waste into the well. So that's, of course, a problem that I admit. Uh, but this is also why I'm still struggling a bit with this kind of uh, dichotomous perception of profane versus ritual. So, yeah, it's quite a complex question, but it's happening. Um, I mean, not totally regularly in the sense that it's over the half or something, but it's happening again and again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gail Higginbottom is remarking that a uh, well is necessary. Uh, it's a great time server and maybe just for cooking and drinking or <laughs> other purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, or kind of daily cleansing, cleansing prior to certain activities. What mm -hmm. um, 
I could contribute from, from a late Iron Age. Uh, the, in Basel, we act, have actually wells in a late Iron Age settlement, and the settlement is immediately close to the mm -hmm. Rhine. So yeah. people don't need the water. <laughs> they dig yeah. the wells for other reasons, and the, the wells are in the end filled not only um, with household material and possible rubbish, but they, they also serve as, um, um, as graves. So we have skeletons in them, uh, animals and whole, um, whole people. And um, yeah. We, yeah. this is very much ritual and not throwing mm -hmm. away. Yeah. yeah, I think we really have to, to see this importance of uh, any kind of uh, feature or part of the society which can somehow that develop also in certain contexts. I mean, there are also other examples, at least I know one example from the Neolithic context, in which also um, uh, a burial was taking place on, on top of a well, so to say, and such too far away in, in terms of, of time. And um, in with reference to LBK wells, um, I think the closest proximity to rivers and other surface water sources is 200 meters. And sometimes the wells themselves are 200 meters apart from the village. So. I think it's at least not only about convenience. Of course, it's practical to have a to have a well in your village, but I think this is uh, certainly not um, the only uh, aspect which is important here. And with regard to cleaning activities, um, actually the well of Alcherbitz uh, very clearly showed that they um, regularly cleaned the well. So there are there is a layer on the bottom which is showing that uh, all the waste, so pots which were falling into the well, simply because that happens, of course, that they were actually taken out of the well. So it's, uh, I think this is also an argument why not all of this kind of deposition layers are somehow, yeah, just in this kind of profane mode. But we can clearly see that they were cleaned and, um, yeah, kept in a good shape. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm watching out for questions. <laughs> uh, Maybe one more, more thought. Uh, coming back to Nagaland and the ponds, was mm. this also was this like a well, a freshwater reserve, or very different uses? And um, it was at least sometimes used for fishing. Um, again, so that the fish is breeded there because, as I said, the rivers are sometimes um, very far away. So that's a problem. Why this kind of fishing activities is uh, not that easy sometimes in Nagaland. And um, but the problem with the ponds, in special, I was talking, um, or someone told me that um, the problem is that uh, they have a lot of mosquitoes, of course, and uh, it gets polluted very easily. So whether or not it can be really used, so it's hard to maintain them in a state that they can be actually used for fishing, for example. But they were still used as a place to simply be. So it's a very special place because uh, this kind of ponds are not. Uh, in a natural sense, uh, natural lakes and so on are not um, scattered all around. So that's also why it's an important place to gather and so on. Welcome. Uh, yeah, we have uh, Katalina Botic uh, quickly points out that with heavy rains, rivers and streams are not usable for drinking water while wells mm -hmm. would stay usable. Mm -hmm. And Alexandra Anders, um, Ah, answering to to Katharina ah, yeah. in Olga Hungary, fifth cent, fifth millennium BC, um, linear, and and there must be a culture. I don't know. <laughs> we have the same dual use of well, well for fresh water mm. and ritual deposition. More than a hundred vessels. So this is really a pattern. This is uh, in prehistoric Europe. It's it's very yeah. Mm. So that it could be also kind of. Um, Closing a well, like um, burying a house, burying as a whole settlement. There were such rituals that, that we don't really understand today anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And this kind of behavior, of course, makes sense in many regards. I mean, if a community decides to build up a, a well and uh, construct this kind of really sometimes very elaborate structures, uh, it might be a good reason to somehow have this kind of position practices and so on and we are also might see it at the end to close this kind of lifetime of a feature yeah but for me really the most important important part is to stop this um thinking that we need to put it into one context only because we see it so often in archaeological features that they're used in so many different ways yeah yeah 
what I find fascinating, what we what we need to do more is this going out of Europe and uh, looking at you know these cultures in especially mm -hmm. in India, which still have the megalithic traditions and they mm -hmm. can do much more. In uh, I know an example from Tamil Nadu where you have uh, megaliths um, type partly serving as burial grounds, which are which were still in use in the early medieval period, so they have much longer mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, traditions and some of them are still live you yeah. can ask people yeah. yeah yeah and to me this is also concerned uh, i heard it also in a session today and i liked it a lot and um that we also have of course some responsibility as scientists who are speaking about the major part of the human past so i think um we need to to be very careful that we involve many different views on the world and how things might be done and how people tend to organize them them themselves i mean it's there's this yeah this uh, huge diversity we can also see see today in any kind of context i'm not only speaking about some recent context but also nowadays of course so i think it's very important that we always try to broaden our understanding or to do somehow justice so to say to the case studies we're working with and really trying to keep an open mind and to me this kind of um, ethnological approaches are a really big help in that. But this doesn't mean that I'm saying this is an explanation for everything, of course, but um, yeah, it's, to me, it's really a help to try to step beyond my own kind of socialization, my own understanding. Yeah, look from outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is wonderful. Uh, I can't see questions coming at the moment, so we are coming to <laughs> the the end of the of the conference and um, I would like to um, thank you very much Maria and especially also also uh, our volunteer yeah. and the secretariat who helped us to make this possible and um, of course the scientific committee the executive board but then also the the many people who joined us here uh, online while we had such a big cultural break um, yeah since since the beginning of the year, everything changed. We ha we had to change. We have to think about how we do Kiel next year. Everything, yeah. and uh, but he's get, got us um, uh, thinking, and uh, yeah, and I'm so happy we are here together and can discuss and mm -hmm. try and try and yeah. make it possible. What is not so easy at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Me too. So thank you for everyone still joining also on a Sunday evening. So it's very nice, of course. And just thought that there's a, another question. Changing. Oh. Is the change yeah, so individual and communal use of the terraces in Nagaland regulated by special mm -hmm. personalities or is a natural change? So it's more of a natural change. So, I mean, there's no personality or not at least a single personality who could decide this. So there's a village council. And this is this what well, was this kind of village council nowadays not it's fading somehow in its importance but that village council was entitled to take decisions um but in general it's quite simply when the fields are chosen they are chosen and then they are used in this kind of common way but there's no strict regulation to this and this is a behavior which is really a pattern so it's also in other regards for example someone decides to erect a stone on the terrace field of a different person that's also allowed so there's also no one regulating this kind of placement of stones so you can basically erect it on any kind of property so there are specific ways to to yeah to cut off this kind of individual ownership um kind of concepts yeah good wonderful yeah